بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه ما بعد so last Wednesday we had done the issue of the story of the Muslims in Abyssinia and we had concluded that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had told them the very day that Negus died, the very hour that he died, he told them uh, that he had died and the Prophet ﷺ prayed Salatul Janazah over the Najashi. And this was the only time in the whole seerah that the Prophet ﷺ prayed uh, Salatul uh, Janazah al Ghaib. And we said there's some fiqh issues then derived from this. Uh, what should we do if somebody dies who's famous? Should we pray Salatul Janazah over somewhere else? Or is it only the one who has not been prayed over does somebody else pray over them? And there's the former that have different opinions. Uh, just a few last issues of Abyssinia before we move on. Uh, the Muslims of Abyssinia remained there for another roughly 10 or 11 years. And this is a very significant point because the Prophet has emigrated to Medina in another 2-3 years. Right? He emigrated to Medina and yet the Muslims remained in Abyssinia after Medina and after Badr. And after Uhud, and after Khandaq, yani the Prophet is basically telling them to stay there. It was only after uh, the battle of Ahzab, and uh, uh, when the Prophet had expelled basically all of the Yehud from the surrounding areas, the battle of Khaybar took place, and after this the Prophet sent a letter to Ja'far telling him to bring all the Muslims to Medina. Now, this is interesting because one wonders why did the Prophet want the Muslims to remain in Abyssinia when he was in Medina and when he's already winning battles and he needs manpower and he needs people there. What is the reason? And Allahu A'lam, but the only reason that makes sense is that the Prophet had a backup plan. Plan B. In case Medina does not work, there is plan B. And this shows us the long-term planning of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's not just يعني, tawakkal ala Allah, khalas, everything. Of course he has tawakkul, but he's tying his camel. He's planning and he's thinking what's going to happen if Medina does not work out. Right? And only when he is firmly established in Medina, which is basically the battle of Khaybar was the last uh, significant basically uh, interaction with the Yehud of the surrounding areas and then he expelled all of the immediate threats around Medina. And he is now completely solidified in Medina. So it seems therefore that Abyssinia remained a plan B until Medina was 100% secured. Then he told Ja'far, come back now. And after this then of course there were no uh, Muslims remaining in Abyssinia. Now there remains a controversy which I don't think we'll ever resolve unless we discover some new, new books. Did any of the Abyssinians convert to Islam when the Muslims were there? In other words, did they give da'wah to the locals and did the locals convert to Islam? Uh, Allahu A'lam, there doesn't seem to be uh, any type of numerous reports, but there might be some indications that a few Abyssinians embraced Islam with their in interaction with the Muslims. But for sure, and we have to be frank here, Islam did not pass down in Abyssinia until basically uh, Islam conquered lands in Abyssinia. And this of course happened after another 50, 60 years. So Islam did not make a strong presence just by da'wah in this land of Abyssinia. And there might be many reasons for this, but they did of course convert Najashi. Did they convert anybody else? Allahu A'lam. Maybe they did. There are some reports that indicate maybe there were some Muslims in Abyssinia, but there wasn't any large uh, presence of Islam until Islam came back to Abyssinia and conquered it as a political uh, power. Uh, one more incident that we need to mention about uh, Abyssinia, and that is the fact that uh, Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh, Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh, uh, a cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he passed away, he died, and his wife was Umm Habiba binti Sufyan. His wife was the daughter of uh, Abu Sufyan. Uh, and so Umm Habiba then became a widow, and there was no one to take care of her in Abyssinia. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent her a marriage proposal, while she was in Abyssinia and the and of course this is after her idda and he sent it through the Najashi. He sent it through the Najashi and so the Najashi 
took charge of the marriage and he was the one who gifted the mahr on behalf of the Prophet, even though the Prophet didn't ask him to do this, right? But he was the one who gifted the mahr uh, to Umm Habiba and uh, she then went back to Medina. Uh, Najashi had a delegation take her back to Medina and she became uh, one of the Ummahat al Mu'minin. We now return to the affairs in Mecca. What was happening in Makkah during this time? Notice Abyssinia does not involve the Prophet directly. The Prophet himself never went to Abyssinia. It doesn't involve him directly. However, because it involves the Muslims who are obviously taking commands from the Prophet it is always discussed within the realm of Sirah, even though there's no direct contact between Abyssinia and the Prophet What's happening in Makkah? In Makkah, two major conversions took place after the emigration to Abyssinia. After the Muslims had left to Abyssinia, the second emigration, remember we said they came back, they stayed there for a while, and then this convinced uh, around 80 or so uh, men to emigrate again, another 20 women. So from 14, they went to around 110, 120, right? So they went five times more. It, it, uh, the, the number increased fivefold. So the Muslims left to Abyssinia, and Therefore, the number and quantity of Muslims went down very little. Some scholars said it was around, and they have a very precise number, 38 or 37 men only. The bulk of the Muslims had left to Abyssinia. More than 100 had gone to Abyssinia, right? So at this time, there's only 150, 180 of uh, all of the Sahaba. So Allah Azza wa Jal then blessed two people to embrace Islam that caused a huge uh, factor of safety for the Muslims. The first of them was Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The story of Hamza's conversion is one of the most uh, strange stories of conversions ever. And it is narrated that uh, Hamza was a well-known uh, archer, he was a well-known hunter, he would go and he would uh, go on long expeditions and he would, every time he would return home, the first thing he would do is that he would go to the Kaaba, uh, do tawaf and then go back home. This was the sunnah of most of the people of Mecca, they would respect the Kaaba. So during one of these trips, it so happened that the Prophet wasallam was in Mecca and Abu Jahl met him close to the mountain of Safa. And Abu Jahl was in a foul mood that day for some reason. And he just began his insults and his cursing and his shatim and his uh, rude manners. And he cursed him like he had never cursed him before. Verbally, he didn't touch him, he just kept on cursing him and his ancestors. And the Prophet remained silent, not saying one word back. Until Abu Jahl basically got tired and went on his way. And the women of the Banu Hashim, got extremely insulted because they don't care Muslim or non-Muslim. This is your insulting our tribe. Abu Jahl is the Banu Makhzum, remember, right? And they are the Banu Hashim. And when he's insulting his forefathers, and obviously it's the Banu Hashim being insulted. So the women of the Banu Hashim got very insulted. That who does this man think he is to curse our fathers and to make fun of our member? And there was no man of the Banu Hashim close by. So when Hamza returned, some of the women began to basically uh, taunt him that what type of uncle are you? What type of leader are you of the Banu Hashim when your own nephew is insulted and no one stands up to defend him? Basically, where's your honor for the Banu Hashim? Doesn't matter Islam, no Islam. It's a matter of family honor, right? That it's, we have no honor left if one of our members can be insulted. So he said, what happened? So they said, Abu Jahl stood there for 15, 20 minutes, however long, just haranguing him, just insulting him. And not one person stood up to defend. And he said this, and he said that, and they narrated all that he said. And Hamza's blood began to boil. And this caused him to become so angry. And he asked, did the other people see, was this a public insult? Because it's a matter of pride for him. Right? So the, the other people see this humiliation. They said the home of Makkah saw it. Everybody saw it. It's a public insult. And so he basically lost it. And he marched to the Kaaba, still with his, uh, uh, still with his uh, bows and arrows and, and, and hunting uh, equipment. And he marched straight to Abu Jahl and took his bow and smacked him across the face with his bow. Caused a huge uh, uh, gush of blood to come out.
And he said, how dare you curse my own nephew? And then he didn't even realize what he was saying and he blurted out, and I too am a follower of his religion. He didn't plan this. It was just anger. That what are you going to do now? It's a matter of look now. I also say that I'm following his religion. And I'm upon his faith. And this of course shocked, shocked him as much as it shocked everybody else. He didn't even think about saying this statement. It just came out out of, as the Quran says, Hamiyat al-Jahiliyyah, which is basically the, the, the bigoted uh, feeling of just uh, ancestry. This is a uh, type of pride that has no basis to it. So he just wanted to defend the Prophet because he's his nephew, and he's saying, he's my nephew, and I'm also one of his religion. Now what are you going to do? And Hamza was also known to be a strong man. There were a few men who were, mashallah, yani, well known in Mecca, and Hamza was one of them. And when he hit Abu Jahl like this, and Abu Jahl was sitting down and he was standing up, the Banu Makhzum that were around him stood up to go and defend him. But Abu Jahl said, leave him be. For wallahi, today I cursed his nephew like I never cursed him before. Meaning, I know why he's angry. Leave him be, I cursed his nephew like I never cursed him before. And then Hamza returned home, confused, dazed. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? I, I didn't plan to accept Islam. I don't know if this is the truth or not. And he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, oh Allah, you know that I am one of the leaders of the Quraysh. And I have now said something that I don't know, I cannot take it back. It's too embarrassing to take back. So if this matter is true, then cause my heart to be guided to it. And if it is not true, then cause me to die right now. I can't, I'm in a trap now. Because I just said I'm a Muslim, but I don't believe in Islam. And so he made this dua to Allah. And he spent the most miserable night of his life tossing, turning, thinking what to do. And the next morning he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh my nephew, this is what happened yesterday. And he explained what happened. Now what should I do? He hadn't intended to convert. So the Prophet ﷺ stood up and began talking to him, admonishing him, telling him about Islam, exhorting him, convincing him of La ilaha illallah, until finally after that conversation, Hamza said, I testify that you are a truthful person, and you're speaking the truth, and now I don't ever want to return to the paganism or the religion of my forefathers. So Hamza's conversion story was not one that initially he was sincere for Islam. Rather, he was sincere for tribalism. And it just came out, but when it came out, what is he going to do now? And so he made a dua to Allah. If it is really true, O oh Allah, then open my heart to Islam. Otherwise, cause me to die. Well, he didn't die. And as he thought about it and the Prophet convinced him, he said, this is indeed the truth. And of course, Hamza then uh, became the Sayyid the Shuhada, the leader of the Shuhada in the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, as you all know, he died a very tragic death and he became the leader of the uh, Shuhada. So when Hamza accepted Islam, this was a big boost for the Prophet ﷺ because he finally had support from the elders of the Quraysh. He finally had, this Hamza's conversion was the senior most Qurashi to convert up until this point. I mean, he's the son of Abdul Muttalib, what more do you want, right? He's the brother of Abu Talib, the chieftain, what more do you want? So the senior most person to convert was Hamza up until this point. And when Hamza converted, Ibn Hisaq says, they had to tone down their animosity. They had to tone down the irritation of the Prophet and the Muslims. So the conversion of Hamza was a big boost. A few days later, according to one report, three days later, Allah followed it up with another boost. Nurun ala nur. And that was of course the conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The conversion of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the conversion of Umar along with the conversion of Hamza, it most likely occurred in the month of Dhul Hijjah of the sixth year of the Da'wah, i.e. around four or five years before the Hijrah, the sixth year of the Da'wah. And so, uh, both of them, they converted, as we said, uh, very short after one another. One report says only three days uh, between them. And I already mentioned to you uh, last week the story of Layla binti Abi, uh, binti Abi Hathman, that when she was packing her bags and going to Abyssinia, I already mentioned the story, and she was in a very irritated mood because they're leaving their homeland. This is for the second Hijrah, not the first one. The second Hijrah when they have to leave again. And Umar passes by. 
and he sees the, the baggage and he sees the, the camels being loaded and he asks, where are you going? And she says, that uh, you dare ask, and you, you have no manners, I mean you're asking because of you we're having to immigrate. And because of your animosity, and because you have made this world so difficult for us, we have to leave our land and leave our belongings and leave our family in order to go to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the land of Abyssinia. And she was very irritated at him and Hamza, and she was expecting a harsh response back. But for the first time she saw Hamza affected. Uh, so Umar, she saw Umar affected. And Umar softened at her comments. And Umar said, has it reached this level? Has it reached this level? Meaning, I didn't realize I was that bad. Has it reached this level? And he then made dua for her, and he said that, may Allah give you barakah wherever you go. And he's actually got soft for her. May Allah give you barakah wherever you go. And so, as, you, as, as I said last time, when her husband came back, she was so excited. You'll never guess what happened. Umar ibn al-Khattab himself, yani he said this and I said this and then he, he seemed to soften up. And uh, you know the response that uh, her husband said, that do you really think he's going to accept Islam? By Allah, his father's donkeys will accept Islam before he does, right? And this is of course uh, his perception of what would happen. But he didn't know that the Prophet had made a dua to Allah. And this dua is narrated in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi that uh, Ibn Umar, Umar ibn Khattab's son, Ibn Umar says that the Prophet had made a dua to Allah. Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahabb hadayn al-rajulayn ilayk bi Abi Jahl aw bi Umar ibn Khattab. The Prophet had said, Oh Allah, bring glory to Islam with one of these two men who is the more beloved to you. Either Abu Jahl or Umar ibn al-Khattab. And these two men were the most severe enemies to Islam. And these two men were also of the physically most powerful, and also in terms of lineage the most powerful. So the Prophet said, one of these two, O oh Allah, give him to me. The one who is more beloved to you. And Ibn Umar said, Umar was the one who was more beloved than Abu Jahl. And indeed it shows us that guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These two people were beyond hope. Nobody could ever have imagined that either could convert to Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the heart of Umar to come to Islam. We should never give up hope for anybody. We should never just pa pass a stamp and a verdict that khalas. No, Allah knows best. And Allah knows whose heart has some good in it. And it also shows us as well that there is no denying that people of influence and people of power have more of an impact upon the masses than other people. And therefore it is also a sign of intelligence to talk to them, concentrate upon them. Of course not to ignore the others, but it's a sign of intelligence. The Prophet is making dua specifically for these two people. There's a reason for this, right? Because the masses by and large look up to certain people. And if one of them converts, if one of the symbols or leaders of a society converts, it brings about a sense of recognition, a sense of peace, a sense of ease. I mean, here in America, there is nobody who has done more positive image for Islam than Muhammad Ali, the boxer. Nobody in the last 40 years, you know, and nobody can do uh, except a person of that figure, right? Because this is a person who is beloved, a person who everybody admires. And then he basically publicly converts to Islam and shows the people, this is what Islam is. You can have a million scholars, they're not going to do what Muhammad Hadi did. Right? This is just the reality. And it is wise for us to then concentrate on this and to realize that there are people who will have a bigger impact on communities than other people. And so, Allah Azza wa Jal guided Umar ibn al-Khattab to Islam. And of course, Umar's conversion, yani it was a watershed moment. It was a black and, and, and white. It was a day and night moment. Ibn Mas'ud said, uh, when Umar ibn al-Khattab was, was on his deathbed, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, we have ever remained in Izzah since Umar has converted up until now. We have ever remained in Izzah from the time of Umar's conversion up until his basically Khilafah. And of course his Khilafah was truly the pinnacle of the Muslim Ummah. 
Without any question in terms of political strength, there is no question what happened in the time of Umar, the battles of uh, 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 Yarmouk and Qadisiyah and, and all of these uh, futuhat, all of these conquests in Egypt and in Azerbaijan and Armenia and in uh, Damascus and in Jerusalem and everything of Umar is just amazing in his Khilafah what happened. So when he was about to pass away, Mas'ud said, we have ever remained in Izzah ever since Umar converted to Islam. We were not even able to pray in the Haram. Ibn Mas'ud never once prayed in the Haram until on the day Umar converted. That was the day we all were able to pray in the Haram. Ibn Mas'ud is saying his own eyewitness. We were never able to pray in the Haram until Umar uh, converted. And it was in his once, uh, one report says, Ibn Abbas asked him, O oh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, how did you get the title Al-Faruq? How did you get this title? Because we have Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar Al-Faruq. How did you get the title Al-Faruq? Al-Faruq means the one who divides truth from falsehood, the one who divides good from evil. This is what Al-Faruq means. So he said that the Prophet gave me this title when I converted and we marched to the Kaaba on that day for the first time. All of the Muslims publicly marched to the Kaaba and headed by two rows. I was in the first row and Hamza was in the second, the two people who had just converted, right? And we marched to the Kaaba and we basically had a jama'ah, a saf for the first time we prayed in public. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ said, you are Umar al-Faruq. You have now basically separated. <laughs> you have allowed the truth to come public now. So the Prophet ﷺ himself gave him the title of Al-Faruq. How did he accept Islam? Uh, actually, there's more than one story narrated. I know all of you know the one story. There's more than one story narrated about his conversion. And usually when that is the case, then his conversion then is a combination of all of these factors. This happened, this happened, this happened. Finally, his heart then uh, uh, basically accepted Islam. It is narrated that once Umar ibn al-Khattab went during the evening and Umar was, uh, as most of the men were, he loved to drink. He loved to drink. And he had drinking companions. So he went out at night having a craving for drinking. He went to the house where all of the young, he was young at this time, 25 years old or so, where all of the young men would go and uh, drink. And he found that none of them were there. He went to another house, then for some reason they were not there. He went to the wine cellar, even the wine cellar was not there, the one that they get their, their wine from. So he said, let me just go to Tawaf now. Uh, it's amazing, instead of the pub, he goes to the haram. He just wants to get out of his mind, basically, right? Let me go to the waf now. Get my mind off of this craving. So he went at night to the Kaaba, and there are no lights there. It's a dark place, you know? And he heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting Quran. All alone, in the middle of the night, basically, right? Praying in front of the Kaaba, subhanAllah. No fear, no nothing. No guards, no. He's just praying in front of the Kaaba. And so, Umar thought to himself, now is my time to beat him up, do something, nobody's here, all alone, this is my time to basically get some revenge and, and you know, do some dastardly deed and nobody's gonna see me. So he quietly crept up behind the Prophet and obviously he's reciting Quran, what's gonna happen? He stopped and he began listening. And I keep on telling myself and all of you, SubhanAllah, we look and we want to listen to these Qadis and we li we're, we're enthralled by their voices. We pray that inshallah one day we can hear the Prophet and recite the Quran. What will his voice be like and how much it will move us to listen to that, right? So Umar had never actually stood and listened to the Quran. I mean, they're all just busy hating to actually, and this is, you know, people just want to hate. They don't want to listen. And so Umar, for the first time, is basically stopped in his track and now listening to the Prophet directly uh, reciting the Quran. And nobody knew he was there. Even the Prophet was oblivious. He was completely lost in his uh, recitation. And Umar uh, is narrating the story himself. It is narrated in Muslim Imam Ahmad. He's narrating in the first person. And he said, I stood behind him and he began reciting Surah al haqqa And he said, فَتَعَجَّبْتُ مِنْ تَأْلِيفِهِ I was amazed at the rhythm, the sequence. And Allah, as every surah, but especially these Meccan surahs, the Meccan surahs, they are just powerful. The Madi Madani surahs are eloquent in a longer style way. But the Meccan surahs, you all know, the small verses, each one is like an upper right and upper left, one after the other. 
And so Umar said, فَتَعَجَّبْتُ مِنْ تَأْلِيفِهِ I was just amazed at its uh, composition. And while the Prophet is reciting, this is an amazing story, he began to think to himself, where is this coming from? So he said, هَذَا وَاللَّهِ قَوْلُ شَاعِرٍ This is, wallahi, this must be the statement of a beautiful poet. Just like the Quraysh are saying. And as soon as he thought of this, Surah Al-Haqqa says what? وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ So then Umar says, okay, it must be a kahin. <laughs> it must be a sorcerer. What is the next verse? وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Right? So Umar says, where is this from then? What's the next verse? تَنزِيلُ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ What if he's inventing it? وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ لَأَخَذْنَاهُ بِالْيَمِينَ ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ Basically, it's a conversation that Allah is having with Umar ibn al-Khattab through the Prophet and the Prophet doesn't even know about it. He doesn't even know about it because he's just reciting the Qur'an and Umar is just thinking thoughts to himself, right? What if this is a poet? This cannot be the po poet. You have no uh, thinking. You're not thinking through. Well, what if it's a kahin? It's not a kahin, don't you see? Well, where is this from? It's from Allah Azza wa Jal. Tanzeelu min Rabbil Alameen. What if he's inventing it? If he were to invent anything and ascribe it to us, we would hold him by the right hand and cut off his jugular vein. He would never dare ascribe anything to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So basically every doubt Umar is thinking, Surah Al-Haqqa is responding back to at that very time until he finished the whole surah. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, that was the first time Islam entered my heart and took over it. He didn't accept yet. But that was the first time that he became a little bit sympathetic to Islam. And he didn't do anything to the Prophet and he went back home. Then of course the famous story happened that all of you are familiar with. That one day uh, the people of the Quraysh were sitting around and Umar was with them. And Abu Jahl once again began his tirade against the Prophet And Abu Jahl said, this man has done more to insult our fathers and gods than anybody else. He has cursed our religion. He has said that anybody who worships idols uh, will be punished and, and going to hell. This means our forefathers. He is making fun of our forefathers. Who will finally rid us of this man? And by the way, there were multiple assassination attempts, multiple talks of killing the Prophet And of course, towards the end, it got more and more and more. And that's why he had to make hijrah. So this is one more talk like this in the sixth year of the hijrah, of, not hijrah, sixth year of the da'wah. Abu Jahl says, by Allah, anybody who succeeds in doing it, I promise him 100 camels, red and black, the choiciest colors. And as I said, red camels actually means uh, dusky brown. That's what they called red camel. Not a red like we have red. There is no such thing as a red camel. But by red, they mean the camel, the color that we think of when we think of a camel. They called that a red camel. And then of course, uh, black camels were also prized. These were the two most expensive camels. So he said, I'll give him 100 camels, red and black. And I'll also add 100 uqiyya pouches of silver. Basically, I give my entire wealth, whoever goes kills this man, a'udhu billah. So Umar now got greedy and said, well, let me go do it. Khalas, this is a good amount of money, let me go do it. And so he went back home, he took his sword out and he walked with an unsheathed sword. As you all know the story, he walked with an unsheathed sword. And here the riwayat of Ibn Ishaq and others say that a number of things stopped him along the way. And he heard voices with poetry, with uh, eloquent Arabic telling him that what are you doing? This is just a man saying la ilaha illallah. So basically there, there seems to be some supernatural events happening and he kept on ignoring and just uh, not thinking about it. Until finally he passed by uh, Nu'aym ibn Abdullah al Naham. And Nu'aym ibn Abdullah had just accepted Islam but he had not told anybody about it. And he saw Umar with this anger, with walking with a sword up and down the streets of Mecca and he says, where are you going? Umar, what happened? You can see death in his eyes. Yani, where are you going? And so uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said that enough is enough. We have been cursed too long and our ancestors have been ridiculed. I am now going to kill this man, uh, Muhammad. So of course, uh, Nu'aym panicked because this was Umar ibn al-Khattab. He's going to kill the Prophet And so Nu'aym said, have you lost your mind, O Umar? Do you really think that the Banu Abd Manaf, the tribe of the Prophet, the Banu Abd Manaf, the Banu Hashim, will allow you to walk on the face of this earth after you kill one of their own. You're not going to live any, any longer. And if you really want to do something, go back and fix your own family first. What do you mean, fix my own family? 
Don't you know? No, what do you mean? Your own sister and your own brother-in-law have accepted Islam. Why are you going to the Prophet ﷺ? Go fix your own family first. Now, Nu'aim, of course, he's thinking, let me just get him off the back of the Prophet ﷺ. He's not going to harm his sister, is he? So, go to your own family. Get, get him off the way. Let him calm down. When Umar heard this, he became even more enraged. Because this is now a slap on his face. This is insulting. My family has converted. My sister has converted to the faith. No way. And so he marched to his sister's house in anger and as he came close to the door he heard the recitation of the Quran he heard the recitation of the Quran because the Prophet Sallallahu every time somebody converted he would be assigned a teacher he would be assigned a teacher and so they had assigned Khabbab ibn al-Arat we talked about his story before the slave who had been burnt by her, his master, his uh, slave uh, uh, the, the, the lady who owned him uh, so Khabbab had been assigned to Fatima bint al-Khattab, that's his uh, sister, and her husband, Sa'id ibn Zayd. And that is, this is the Zayd, that is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. This is the Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, who remembers Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. One of the Hunafa, one of the people who had stopped worshipping idols, right? And he had died five years before the coming of Islam. And the Prophet said, I saw him in Jannah, he was his own man, his own ummah. He didn't have any ummah because he's his own ummah. He stopped worrying. This is his son, Sa'id ibn Zayd. And Sa'id ibn Zayd had married Umar ibn Khattab's sister. Okay? So this is the husband-wife couple and the Prophet has signed them Khabbab ibn Arad. By the way, subhanAllah, this shows us that even in times of persecution, education of Islam was paramount. Even in times of hiding like this, you needed to know your faith. And you needed to be assigned a teacher to Learn the faith. And subhanAllah, this shows us how important it is to know your religion, to know the Qur'an. Without knowledge, you have no Islam. Even in this persecuted time, the Prophet ﷺ had an educational program up and running. Somebody converts, he's assigned a teacher. And the teacher goes and teaches him how to pray, how to fast, how to read the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, this was at the time of persecution. Fast forward to 2011-2012 in America, somebody converts, we all come and hug him and Jazakallah and then khalas, never hear from him again. Wallah, it's a sad state of affairs that we don't have any sense of, of uh, uh, community, any sense of taking care of those who convert, whereas those in the time of the process, I'm in this persecution, complete secrecy, and there is clearly a educational program. Clearly, there must be people in charge telling off, you get this, you get that, come here, go there. SubhanAllah, it's just amazing if you think about it, right? So, Khabbab was there teaching them the Qur'an. And Umar is hearing this as he's walking to the door. And so Umar barges up, began slamming on the door. And he hears scurried sounds that Khabbab is being put in the closet. And uh, Fatima took the Qur'an and basically almost sat on it. She put her skirt on top of it so that she wouldn't see, he wouldn't see the, the uh, there was a copy of a parchment or maybe it was written on stone. We don't know what it was written on. But in those days, they didn't have paper, as you know. So something is written on it. Maybe it's most likely, it would be some type of stone or, or, or tablet. So she puts it on the bed and then puts her skirt on top of it. Basically, as if she's sitting on it almost, right? So that Umar doesn't see. Come in, come in. What are you doing here at this time of the day? What was this noise I heard? This humming and drumming. What was this? She said, no, no, you didn't hear anything. She goes, by Allah, I know what I heard. And rumor has reached me, or I know now that the both of you have accepted Islam. I know it has been told it. And they began to deny it, and Umar is already enraged, and he took a step forward to basically punch Sa'id, his brother-in-law, to punch uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd. And when he took this step forward, Fatima stood up to try to stop him. The blow landed on her forehead instead of his. And when he punched her, her lip basically burst open and the blood began to flow down. And when this happened, the both of them became enraged. And they said, yes, so what? Do it as you please. If ma badalak, do as you please. We can't beat you, you're, you're sorry, do as you please. We have accepted Islam. And we believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Now when he saw the blood and he saw the, 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 the sincerity, really that's all it is, the courage from both of them, again his heart softened. And again and again we see Umar had a harsh side and he had a soft side. And this continued throughout basically his khilafah as well. Umar is known as a really harsh man, but inside he has a soft heart. Right? He was a very strict and stern person, but inside he had a very merciful and tender heart. And so when he saw his sister bleeding, again he calmed down. And he said, let me see what you are reading. 
Perhaps he remembered Al-Haqqa that he had heard before, you know. Let me see what you were reading. And his sister got worried that, what do you mean? We don't want to give you, because the Qur'an needs to be respected. We don't want to give you the Qur'an. He goes, no, I swear, I am not going to uh, do anything except read the book. And Umar was one of the few who could read and write. Umar was an educated man. He could read and write. So she said, as you know, that you are a mushrik, you are a pagan, uh, and you are not allowed to touch the Qur'an until you have purified yourself. And this shows us that even in this early stage, the people knew that the Qur'an, the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, is a special book. You need to even have wudu to touch it. It's that special that you need to be physically clean to touch the Qur'an. And so Umar said, let me quickly take a ghusl. He went to the corner of the house where they took it and he took a ghusl and he came back and he read Taha as you know. And Islam then entered his heart and he knew that this was true. And so he asked uh, Saeed, where is the Prophet Sallallahu now? And so Saeed saw that his eyes had completely calmed down. He's, he wants to convert. Where is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Saeed said, he is in the house of Al-Arqam. He is in the house of Al-Arqam. And nobody knew this. This was top secret. He is in the house of Al-Arqam. So the, Umar ibn Khattab then proceeded to Al-Arqam's house. The sword is still in his hand. Because he hasn't let go of it. And he goes to the house of Al-Arqam and he bangs on the door of Al-Arqam's house. One of the Sahaba stand up to go see who it is. And he looks through the, 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 the holes of the door and he sees Umar with the sword. And he comes back in trembling. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Umar ibn al-Khattab is outside with a sword in his hand. And Hamza, of course, had just accepted his time. He's in the room as well. So Hamza says, let him in. For if Allah wants good, he's going to accept Islam. And if Allah wants other than this, then the very sword that he's holding will be the end of him. We're going to use his sword against him. The very sword that he's holding will be used against him. And so some of the Sahaba went to the door. They opened it up. They escorted Umar. They held on to his arms. Two people holding on to his arms, right? He's a big guy. And they escorted him to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he sat down in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Ishaq says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held on to his collar and dragged him closer to himself and said, Ya Ibn al-Khattab, what are you doing here? Why did you come here? The Prophet has no fear. Straight, what are you doing here? What is your purpose in coming? And, uh, and he says to him, for by Allah, if you continue in this path, Allah will destroy you with a punishment. If you continue this way, you're going to meet your demise. And this was when Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, I came to accept Islam, believe in Allah, and believe in you, and testify in the truth. Here the Prophet himself said, Allahu Akbar, so loud, that everybody in Al-Arqam's house knew that Umar had accepted Islam. And this was when, after the conversion of Umar, they, for the first time publicly, went to the uh, Kaaba and they prayed uh, publicly for the first time. And they said, that uh, the riwayah says there were around uh, 40 people. There were... Uh, first time with no, no, no. Hamza and Umar went together. Yeah, together. Hamza and Umar went together at this time. Right? So Hamza and Umar were basically leading the way because nobody would dare harm them. These were the two people. They had just fresh converts, right? As we said, three days apart, nobody would dare uh, harm them. And it is m many stories are narrated about his conversion. Of them is that he wanted to personally, personally inform. Abu Jahl of this to yani, rub it in. And so he went knocking at Abu Jahl's door. And uh, he marched to the house of Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl had not heard the news yet. And uh, Abu Jahl opened the door. He saw Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, Ahlan wa sahlan. Yani, welcome. What has brought you here? So Umar said, I have come to personally inform you that I now believe in Allah and in His Messenger. And I am now upon the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Jahl slammed the door in his face and said, May Allah curse you and what you have come with. And this shows the bravery to march to the house of Abu Jahl. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Who is the one who cannot keep any secret? Who is the one who is the most uh, rumor monger? The most tattertale in all of Mecca? So somebody said, Oh, that, must, that is Jamil ibn Ma'mar al-Jumahi. Jamil ibn Ma'mar was the tattletale, the gossiper. Everybody knows he's the town gossiper. So he went to Jamil directly. And he said to Jamil, do you know I have a secret? Do you know? I have just accepted Islam and I'm following the religion of 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jamil was in his house. He jumped up, barely grabbing a garment to cover his nakedness. And rushed outside because he needs to, he wants to be the tattertale, right? And he wants to go tell the people of Makkah. He began screaming in the streets of Makkah before he gets to the Kaaba. And he's screaming along the way, O oh, people of Makkah, O oh, Quraysh, Umar ibn al-Khattab qad sabaa. Sabaa is what they called uh, accepting Islam because there was a religion at that time called Sabianism and they would say that anybody who left uh, the religion of idolatry had become a Sabian. So qad sabaa. And Umar gently corrected him, no, I haven't become a sabaa, I have aslam to. I have accepted uh, Islam. And it is said that on that day a number of people uh, came to Umar ibn al-Khattab publicly in front of the Kaaba and tried to have a number of fights and jostle and shoving with him until finally it is said that Al-As ibn Wa'il, the father of Amr ibn Al-As, the famous Amr ibn Al-As, Al-As ibn Wa'il came and uh, he said, what is the matter with you? Let this man be. If he's chosen a, a path different than yours, it is not, it's none of your business. So basically common sense. Uh, this is Amr ibn Al-As's father. And so Amr ibn Al-As's father, Al-As ibn Wa'il, gave him protection and uh, let him be. And of course there are so many blessings of Umar ibn Al-Khattab. Uh, one of the most authentic and simplest blessings narrated by Bukhari, the Prophet Sallallahu said that there were people before you who were communicated with, that's what it says, muhaddathun, who were communicated with, meaning by the angels, but they were not prophets. There were people before you, angels would communicate to them, but they were not prophets. If there is anybody in my ummah like this, then it is Umar. If my ummah has this type of person, then it is Umar. And Umar ibn Khattab's blessings go on and on and it is enough of a blessing as we said that you see what happened in his Khilafah and you see uh, the Izzah of Islam and how strong Islam became. Islam quadrupled in size in the time of Umar ibn Khattab. Abu Bakr saved Islam by preserving the Arabian Peninsula. But he didn't really, Allah just will. We needed the Abu Bakr to basically solidify or else it would have fragmented. Umar came and then it literally quadrupled in his time. And Uthman's first six years were just a continuation of Umar's uh, policy. So, with these two conversions, the Quraysh really felt threatened. Two things that happened now that is just astounding. Number one, the bulk of the Muslims have fled to a foreign land. And this is humiliating. It is threatening because they don't know what they're going to do over there. They're out of their power. Number two, two of the most promising men of their town have converted. And so this caused them to really come together and think about what they would do. And it is said that in the seventh year of the da'wah, we don't know an exact timeline for this, in the seventh year of the da'wah, all of the Qurayshi tribes came together and discussed what needed to be done until they agreed we need to kill Muhammad. That's the one, only one thing on their minds, to kill, kill, kill. They need to kill Muhammad. And they said, how can we do it? The Banu Hashim are not going to give him over to us. So they said, we will offer whatever blood money open check, blank check, whatever blood money they want, we'll offer it, and we'll even concede to them that none of us will kill him. We'll get some other tribe men pay him and then do the job, right? But they must hand over Muhammad Sallallahu to us. So, for the final time, they went to Abu Talib. They had done it many years before, they had given up, now they're coming as a delegation again. And they say to him that you do not have any choice in the matter. Either you will hand over Muhammad Sallallahu and we will give you whatever blood money and none of us is going to do the job, it's not going to be a Qurashi, or we will have to cut you off from the Quraysh. Again, this is unprecedented. In all of Arabia, this had never happened once before. How are you going to cut us off? We're blood relatives. None of us will allow you to get any food and water. We will boycott you. We will cut off our marriages with you. If anybody is married to one of us, uh, our daughters, we're going to cut him off. And if it's our sons, he's going to divorce. So, no marriages and no money and no business transactions. Any of us who owns a business, we're going to tell him that he cannot buy and sell anything for you. Food, water, drink, nothing. It was a boycott. And when the uh, Quraysh came to Abu, Abu Talib like this, Abu Talib himself became furious. And he said, do as you please, I'm not going to hand my nephew over to you. 
and most likely voluntarily. One report says they were forced, but most likely voluntarily, Abu Talib therefore decided that if we're not going to be able to uh, buy and sell in Mecca, we're going to have any access to the shops of Mecca, then let us go and live elsewhere. And so they emigrated to, not even immigration is called, they basically imposed a uh, type of exile from the city and they moved to some of the valleys that uh, the uh, uh, Banu Hashim owned and they were called the valleys of Abu Talib, Sha'bi Abi Talib. And that's because the uh, Banu Hashim had basically claimed some valleys as their own. I mean, outside of Mecca's empty land. Nobody's going to, so every sub tribe had basically said, this is our camping ground, this is our hunting ground. So they owned some valley or it was basically claimed by them. And so Abu Talib then left to live in that uh, valley and every single person from the Banu Hashim and the Banu Muttalib. These are the two uh, twin tribes or the two cousin tribes. Basically, uh, the Banu Abdi Manaf, so the great grandfather of the Prophet, all of his sub tribe. So the Banu Hashim and the Banu Muttalib, they voluntarily went into what is called the famous boycott. And this is the incident of the, uh, of the boycott. And in order to solidify this, the Quraysh came together and wrote a pact amongst themselves. They wrote a treaty amongst themselves that everybody has to uphold this treaty. What is the treaty? Nobody will buy and sell to the Banu Hashim. Nobody will marry into or from the Banu Hashim. Nobody will basically socialize with the Banu Hashim. So it is a boycott of an economic, a political, a social level. Everything is going to be cut off from the Banu Hashim. And they wrote a treaty and they hung it inside the Kaaba. And of course nobody entered the Kaaba. So they locked the door and it was inside the Kaaba. It is said that uh, Bu'aid ibn Amr was the one who wrote this treaty and the Prophet made dua against him and his hand became uh, paralyzed until he died. So this complete boycott forced the Banu Hashim to leave Mecca and they lived outside of Mecca for how long? Some say two and some say three years. There doesn't seem to be... Uh, one of the interesting points is also sad for us. We don't have too much information about this period. Why not? For many reasons. Firstly, who lived from this time until way after Medina to tell us what happened. There were very few people, right? Bilal has a few reports, Ibn Mas'ud has a few reports. Otherwise, I mean, who lived? Secondly, as we all know, bad memories, we tend to just gloss over them. We don't narrate them in detail. We don't want to think about these things. So those who went through this time, they didn't narrate that much about what happened. It was a very difficult and traumatic time for them. And so for two or three years, they lived in this uh, abandoned, uh, basically, valley, eking out an existence, getting rainwater, uh, eating from the shrubbery and the leaves. Uh, Bilal says that we used to, st uh, we began defecating like goats defecate, droppings. Our droppings couldn't be told different from the goats. This is how we had to uh, live. And one of their main sources of food was that every few weeks somebody felt sympathy for them and would send in some secret supplies into the valley. It was a somewhat closed valley, which had one main entrance where a camel could go through. And so they would go to uh, the, the, the uh, entrance in the middle of the night. Uh, the most famous amongst them uh, was, uh, of course, Mut'im ibn Adi. Uh, Mut'im ibn Adi. And we mentioned his name many, many, many times. His son became a famous Sahabi, Jubayr ibn Mut'im. Uh, but Mut'im died before the Battle of Badr. Mut'im did not see the Battle of Badr. He was alive up until the Hijrah, right after the Hijrah by a year, he passed away. Mut'im ibn Adi was one of the most sympathetic non-Muslims uh, ever. And the Prophet praised him in many ahadith. We mentioned this of them. After the Battle of Badr, he gave the famous phrase. He said, if Mut'im ibn Adi were alive, and he spoke to me about these captives I have, all of the people of Badr, 70 captives, I would have handed them back to him without any question. No ransom, no nothing. If Mut'im just asked me, I'd hand them all back to him. This is Mut'im, the one who every few weeks, every few months, he would just go with a large camel, laden with food and supplies and water and grain, and just hit it on the back and send it into uh, the valley. And of course, when they caught it, then they could dry the meat, they could keep it and last for many, many weeks. Uh, the Arabs knew how to take, take uh, care of the, of the camel in that sense. Uh, it is also reported that a few other people, um, Hakim ibn Hizam, who was uh, Khadija's nephew, and he later became a fam famous Sahabi, Hakim ibn Hizam also would do this. Once in a while, he would send in some food secretly. Otherwise, they eked out an existence. It is said that when they tried to go to the city, even when foreigners came, 
Because foreigners are not under the boycott. During Hajj season, they're coming with supplies. Sometimes they try to sneak in some food. Sometimes they were successful. Other times, if they were caught or the people saw them, Abu Jahl would come and say, do not sell to these people. I will pay, pay you double whatever they're offering you. I'll pay you double. Because those people are not barred, right? It's only the Quraysh who are barred from selling to the Muslims. So when a foreign businessman came, even then Abu Lahab would say, or uh, Abu Jahl would say, don't, don't pay anything. I'm going to pay you double. Even during these two, three years, the Prophet ﷺ continued to give da'wah during the Hajj season. He would go out of the valley and he would meet with the tribes during the Hajj season and uh, continue to try to find converts to the uh, faith. When did and how did the boycott stop? As we said, the boycott probably lasted two or three years. And a number of incidents were happened that brought about its conclusion. The first of these is that the Prophet ﷺ made a dua against them and said, Oh Allah, send upon them a famine like the famine of Yusuf. That bad. Send upon them a drought and a famine like the famine of Yusuf. And so, the famine became so bad for the people of Mecca that they were forced to eat carcasses and to chew on uh, dead uh, animal skin. They had nothing else left after uh, that time and they realized this was because of the dua of the Prophet wasallam. and they sent some messengers to try to bring about some uh, reconciliation. Uh, the second incident, and again all of these things shows that two, three, four things happen at the same time. The second incident is that some of the people of Quraysh whose hearts were softer, we already said this, uh, some of their names, they decided that they should do something to break the pact. And so the main one here was uh, Hisham ibn Amr. And Hisham ibn Amr uh, was the grandson of Abdul Muttalib through his mother. His mother was Atiqa. His mother was Atiqa, binti Abdul Muttalib. So his mother is the aunt of the Prophet. So the Prophet is his cousin through his mother. So his mother's brother is Abdullah. So uh, uh, um, uh, Hisham ibn Amr, Hisham ibn Amr felt that he needed to do something. So he called his friend. Uh, Zuhair ibn Abi Umaymah and they said what can we do to bring about an end to this boycott so they said first thing we need to do is to bring about all of the people who are sympathetic get them together it's common sense get some strength together so they thought who can they invite and they invited the people whom we mentioned uh, Mutim ibn Adi number one on their list Mutim ibn Adi let's bring him in uh, Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham uh, other people three four five people whom they knew did not like the boycott strength in numbers as always brings you that strength and then they said what can we do what plan can we do so Zuhayr said I have a plan Tomorrow, when all of the people are in the gathering of the Quraysh, in the Nadi, in the uh, parliament, let's not, this is what we're going to do. So he laid out a plan. The next day, they went to the Kaaba and they all seated where they usually sit. Everyone goes to his place in this corner, that corner, that corner. Then Zuhay stood up and he began asking, and Zuhay was the one who was the farthest removed genealogically, so the least doubt will be about his niyyah. About his intention. Yani if uh, Hisham has stood up, they're going to say, you're his cousin, who are you? So Zuhayr is a bit farther away. So Zuhayr stood up and he said, for how long are we going to starve our own kith and kin to death? This is a evil thing that we have, so he's brave. He's basically speaking the truth, right? Abu Jahad became furious. Who do you think you are? We all agreed to this treaty. So when he said this, Hisham stood up. No, I didn't agree. You agreed. This is your idea. What do you mean it's my idea? We all, we had a meeting here. Mut'im stood up. No, we didn't. This was something you forced on us, right? I didn't force it on you, we all agreed. Then uh, the, the fourth one, Abu Bukhtari stood up, right? So one by one, every single person planted strategically around the, the, the Nadi is basically publicly challenging Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl did not have anybody to support him to that level. Because he was the one who was the most antagonistic, right? And so Abu Jahl realized something is wrong. People are just standing up one after the other. And he said, Wallahi, this is a plan that all of you have hatched. This is a plan that all... And that was true, right? It was a plan they had all had. This is a plan that all of you have hatched. But of course they didn't confess to this. And it seemed as if the public support had now shifted away. And then the final thing happened that of course completely turned the tide. One day the Prophet ﷺ went to Abu Talib in the Sha'b, in the valley. And he said that, Oh my uncle, Allah has informed me that 
the treaty that they wrote has been eaten up by termites or ants. Except for the phrase, Bismik Allahum. Just the, in the name of Allah. The whole treaty has... Now the Kaaba is locked up. Nobody goes in. And if the termites are on the paper, they should also be on the Kaaba. I mean, you wouldn't expect the termites just to go there. And, and how would anybody know this? And of course, it is in a sealed pouch. You know, they have a, a parchment. They seal it up. It's in a, a, a cloth and everything. So the Prophet said, Allah has told me, Allah has informed me that... The whole contract has been eaten up except for Bismik Allah. Abu Talib said, your Lord has told you this? He said, yes, he has told me this. Abu Talib said, I will stake my whole case on this. He said, yes, stake it on this. So Abu Talib then for the first time since the enactment of the treaty, marched back with the group of basically non-Muslims of the Banu Hashim. And this shows us, subhanAllah, how strong are the ties of jahili kinship. That even though they're not... Muslims, still, it's a matter of pride. How could you have done this? There was only one coward I forgot to mention. One coward who refused to uh, be deprived of the luxury of living in the city. And that is Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was the one person who basically publicly denounced, like, I have nothing to do with these guys anymore. I am now on your side. And he basically defected away, if you like, from the, uh, the Banu Hashim. So... Abu Jahl did not uh, live in the boycott. He went. He was in the city of Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Talib. Abu Talib went back uh, into the, the the Haram for the first time, and he said, "Oh my people, let's forget about everything. Let's just bring out this treaty, and let's see if we can reach a negotiation and deal." So they became happy that maybe you're gonna agree to hand over the Prophet So they took out the treaty from the, it's still in the, it's still in the, the capsule, or still in the, uh, uh, the cloth, right? And they put it here. Now, Abu Talib said, my nephew has informed me that his Lord has told him that the treaty is no longer in existence. Everything has been eaten except Bismik Allahum. So my challenge to you is, Abu Talib takes it all on his Iman in the Prophet I'm telling the truth. My challenge to you is, if that is the case, then let us be and we'll return to Mecca. And we'll ignore the whole incident basically. And if it's not, then I'll hand over him to you instantaneously. Do with him as you please. He staked everything on what the Prophet told him. Right? So they said, well, of course, I mean, it seems obvious to them. Why would that possibly uh, uh, harm them? And so they opened up the, the bag, they opened up the cloth, and lo and behold, there was no treaty except for the phrase, Bismik Allahum. And they were furiated. They said, this is of the sihr or magic that he's done, but they couldn't do anything because the promise had been given. And therefore, this allowed uh, them to return back to Mecca. And this was what caused the treaty uh, to be, uh, to be uh, annulled. And during this time, there's a, uh, incidents that we cannot narrate because there's too advanced Arabic. One of the things that's most interesting of this time, Abu Talib wrote what is considered to be the most eloquent poem of the Arabic language during this time. And it is called the Lamiyyah. It is called the Lamiya of Abi Talib because every single verse ends with the letter Lam. Every single verse ends with the letter Lam. So it's called the Lamiya, the, the poem of Lam. And it is around a hundred lines of poetry. And it is universally acknowledged to be the pinnacle really of, uh, it's not quite pre-Islamic poetry, but the poetry of that era. Ibn Kathir says this poem beats all of the seven Mu'allaqat uh, al the seven hanging odes. It beats all of them. Not just in style, but in content. Because the seven hanging odes, they talk about women and love and romance and wine. Whereas this one is talking about uh, the, the Quraysh's treatment of them. And how evil the Quraysh were and what they did. And the fact that the haram has not even protected the Quraysh from doing this to their own kith and kin. And so the content is absolutely powerful, unfortunately because we're giving the talk in English, and wallah, even if we were doing it in Arabic, I, I challenge any Arab to read this Lami and understand it. You understand what Ja'ali poetry is like, right? Yani it's very advanced and very beautiful. Nonetheless, uh, uh, Abu Talib composed it during this time, and it is recorded, all Ibn Hisham and others record uh, all of this uh, poem. Some of the benefits we gain from this, and inshallah we'll open the floor for Q&A. Some of the benefits we gain, it's amazing to see the ties of kinship amongst the Banu Hashim. 
the, the Banu Abdi Manaf, even those who are not Muslim, they're going to suffer along with the Muslims merely out of a nationalistic pride, uh, a, a, an anger that they could be treated this way. Abu Talib was not a Muslim and he stayed there in his tent. He stayed there for two or three years. It is all a part of the wisdom and da'wah, therefore, to utilize those who have a soft spot, to take advantage of those who want to stand up for truth and justice. Here we see that three, four, five, six people from the Quraysh, they wanted to help the Muslims. They wanted to help the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of that help. Every single nation and society has some people that are mean and some people that are nice. Every religion has some good and some bad. And we take the good from the people when they offer it. And we use it against their own bad. Which is what the Prophet ﷺ did, right? These were Quraysh, not all of them were evil and, and mean-spirited, even if they're all pagans and idol worshippers. Some of them wanted to break the boycott. And so the Prophet ﷺ took advantage of that. And we too in this land, we're going to find people who, they have nothing but hatred of Islam. They don't want to hear anything. And there are others who want to stand up for truth, for freedom. They want to be open-minded and tolerant. And just like the Prophet ﷺ, we need to take advantage and reach out to those who are open-minded, reach out to those who want to support uh, freedom, and use it against their own bigotry, like the Prophet ﷺ did. And therefore, from this story, uh, we learn that uh, the Prophet ﷺ and, and the Sahaba, they returned back to, uh, to Mecca probably two and a half years, because some rewise they say two, some say three, probably around the tenth year of the da'wah, when the Prophet ﷺ was around 49 years old, they finally returned to Mecca. But unfortunately, as we'll discover soon, inshaAllah, as we continue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them with uh, some of the most traumatic and troubling tests and trials at this time. Uh, the death of Abu Talib, the death of Khadija, and then the incident of Ta'if, one low after the other. This was the lowest period uh, of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and this would all be a precursor to the emigration uh, to uh, Medina. And inshallah, that is something we will continue talking about later on. If there are any uh, questions now, inshallah, we can take them and then break for Salat al Isha. The precursor was that also a precursor to Miraj? The issue of Miraj we will talk about, inshallah, as well later on. Um, there are so many opinions when Mi'raj took place. Some say 5th year of the Da'wah, some say 7th year of the Da'wah, some say 10th year of the Da'wah, some say the last year of the Da'wah. Uh, there's even an opinion that there were multiple Mi'raj. There's even an opinion that there were multiple Mi'raj. One of the biggest problems that the researcher of the Seerah has, there was no calendar at that time. There was no dates. Nobody said, in the 5th year of the Da'wah, in the 7th year of the Hijrah, nobody said that. We all know the calendar was initiated by Umar in the 17th year of the Hijrah, correct? Right? So nobody is telling us dates. They're just telling us things that happened. And every single book of Sirah that you read in our times is a reconstruction of many, many small tidbits narrated that the author of the Sirah book has to reconstruct. And Ibn Hisham himself is no exception. Exception That even Ibn Hisham has to reconstruct events because he doesn't know when exactly it took place. So Ibn Hisham is one opinion. You might find another opinion in, in Ibn Sa'd. You might find another opinion in other books. And it is difficult to say for certain when the Isra and Mi'raj took place. Most scholars say that it took place after the death of Abu Talib and the death of Khadija and the incident of Ta'if. And if this is the case, then it makes a lot of logical sense. But the fact of the matter is at an academic level, I have to tell you, we don't have anything definitive about when it took place. In terms of linking it to a year, we don't. Not even Amul Fil? We don't have a definitive Isra I'm talking about. No, there's nothing narrated about that. The way that the Arabs would have calendars is the way that... Um, Many pagan societies had calendars, and that is that they would reference a year by something major that happened in it. This was the year that Abdul Muttalib died. This was the year that uh, the, 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 the elephant attacked. This was the year. This is how Jahidi. So, you know, as you grow older, you are witnessing the years. So you remember, this was the year the tsunami struck. This was the year the hurricane came. This was the year. So they would mention uh, one event of the year. 
and the year would then be known by that incident. Right? But we don't have records of what these years were called. When Umar instituted the calendar, khalas. And, and even that, the records that we have are incidents, not years and dates. This happened, that happened, this happened. Then we need to reconstruct. And this is the biggest problem of the seerah. Not just for this issue, for any and every issue. Yani, I've done a lot of research into the battle of Uhud. And one of the most confusing things about the battle of Uhud is you have maybe 150 smaller hadith. Well, how do you know what's the order of these hadith? And not just the order, but in fact, there are simultaneous things happening, right? It's the three-dimensional battle, right? There's one front here, another front there, another front there. It's almost impossible, really, to state definitively. You just have to have a little bit of guesswork, a little bit of tawakkul uh, Allah, you know, when you, when you say this. And it's a very difficult thing at an academic level. Of course, at a simple level, you read a book of Sirah, alhamdulillah, good. But at a more advanced level, it's very difficult to try to piece this together. And... I feel it is not fair to not tell you this. So I think it is appropriate that you should know academically Isra wal Mi'raj. Of course we believe it happened. It's mentioned in the Quran. Hadith, there are so many ahadith, but when did it happen? We really don't know. If somebody were to say the fifth year of the da'wah, there would be evidence for that. And if somebody were to say the tenth, eleventh year of the da'wah, there is evidence for that. Allahu alam. You, you talked about uh, not moving faith in the new, talking about Islam and the message. And what do you experience? What is the difference from people? I mean, the people that who are very adversarial and we face them, and some who are more receptive. How do we decide, or how we come, how do we get that kind of a judgment of what's the time to stop? So the question is, I and mean, how do we know when to stop and when to continue? Uh, there's no doubt that we have a limited life and limited resources and we need to prioritize, you know, basically we plant seeds where there's fertile, where there's fertile soil. There's no doubt about that. You know, we are active where there is a room for being active. And when we find a stubbornness, a wall being put between us and the person, we feel disinclined to, to engage. Uh, notice that the Prophet ﷺ in the early phase of the da'wah, i.e. when it was a private da'wah, he only went to those whom he thought would be open-minded. And he didn't even go to Abu Lahab. That's why Tabati Dabi Lahab came down. He didn't go to Abu Jahl. You know, so... We need to have this sense of, well, who do we think is going to be more productive to go to? When I said we don't lose hope, I mean we don't pass a verdict on somebody and say, khalas, there's never any hope for him. There's no doubt our resources are limited. We will have to choose the people that we feel are more conducive, more open-minded. And that will be a judgment call. Even if we're wrong, our ijtihad will not be punished by Allah. You know, we're doing our best. And if somebody comes to us, like Umar came to the Prophet the Prophet never approached Umar because he didn't think it was wise to do so. He didn't approach Abu Jahl. But he did approach many other people who didn't accept Islam. Al-Walid ibn al we mentioned him, right? He went to Al-Walid multiple times. Uh, many of the other seniors of Quraysh. So we need to use our better judgment. And also, of course, there's a common sense point. Whoever you have access to, your circle of interaction is unique to you in the whole world. Nobody has your degrees of influence, right? Nobody has your circle of interaction. So you need to see what is the best way, the best time, the best methodology. And inshallah, whatever ijtihad you do, you're going to be you know, rewarded for this, inshallah. Sisters, any... Um, go ahead. In private or with a group? Because I don't remember in private ever. Maybe there is some, but all I, what I, what I recall... The story was it was a rain and it was a, Abu Jal said if somebody is going to come to my door and ask for something, I would give it to him. And then Prophet it was a story that he went and he knocked on his door and said that I would have given it, but I'm not going to accept it. That's the, it was a story which was... Mentioned. I'll have to look this one up. Allahu I mean, from what I recall, he never approached Abu Jahl one-on-one. It was always in a gathering. But if this is true, then uh, this is true. I'm sorry to ask you another question. Regarding Omar, for instance, he was from his conviction, he went with the he was inspired. So, Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi he prayed for Abu Jahan and Omar. Why Abu Jahan? Because these were the two most powerful, most influential people. So, he is saying, Oh Allah, gift me one of these two people. Give me one of these two people. 
And he knew that Allah could do whatever he wants, right? So from this we derive, like I said, it is a part of our wisdom to concentrate and to give extra attention to those who are people of respect and power and knowledge and, and, and whatnot. There's no question about that. Sisters, any questions with the sisters? None. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in Hashem, although the, 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 the boycott was actually against Muslims, but they went with them because they were their king. How far can the Muslims reciprocate? How far can the Muslims reciprocate? There is no clear-cut uh, line about this, and it's something we need to leave to the scholars of every era to discuss how much reciprocation is allowed. You know, as long as the sha'air of Islam are not compromised, as long as we don't have to worship false gods or do haram, right? To defend with life, limb, and property, this is something the scholars will decide that to what level can we go to? It's a very deep question and it's a very uh, pertinent question in our times, looking at the circumstances we're in. Uh, and it is a question that varies from time to time and place to place. And it varies from conflict to conflict as well. Right? What might be permitted in one conflict might not be permitted in another. So we leave it to the scholars of that era. And I know it's a cop-out answer, but it is the truth. It's not, we cannot have a precise answer for this. At times we will defend them to the death and we accept, well, expect Allah to reward us. Right? And at times it's not something that is worth our, our lives and we'll just defend financially and verbally. And it depends, as we said, time to time, place to place. Uh, with this, I'm afraid I have to...